Hi there. I've just had my batteries changed. I feel wonderful and energized, and it is just in time because we are having a major shift now in this lecture. Okay, let's go back to that chart we began this whole course with, our big grand scheme for thinking about the biology behavior. And what we had was, on the far right, the behavior is produced. And what we've just spent umpteen lectures on is looking at what's gone on a second before that, how did that brain, how did that nervous system produce that behavior. And we've got a pretty good sense of it by now. We've got a feel for the basics of neurobiology from the level of a single neuron up to the level of whole parts of the nervous system, how the nervous system regulates the body, and how the body in turn by way of hormones can regulate the nervous system. We've got this bucket now well in place. And as you remember from the song and dance in the first lecture, another major goal of this course is to avoid thinking in terms of buckets, categories, to think that, okay, we've got neurons and neurobiology under our belt. That's all you need to do to explain the whole world. What we now devote much of the rest of the course to is seeing all the other factors that give rise to how the brain functions. As shown here, again on this diagram, what in the environment a second before made that brain have its responses that trigger that behavior to occur? As we had a first pass at in the last lecture, what sort of hormone levels that hour, that day, made the individual more or less sensitive to that environmental trigger which caused the brain to produce the behavior and so on, this being our strategy working back over time. And what we are going to do in this lecture is transition to a detailed look at the first of those things that came beforehand that regulate how the brain regulates behavior, starting at the basics, starting at what in lots of ways is the central concept of all of biology. You could not think of biology without thinking about the role of evolution. How has evolution, how has natural selection given rise to the sort of fetal life, the sort of hormones, the sort of brain which has something to do with understanding our behaviors? And what we'll focus on in the next couple of lectures is basically the evolution of behavior. Now what is embedded in that concept is anytime you talk about evolution, evolution of behavior, evolution of kidney function, evolution of anything, what you're talking about is the evolution of genes that have something to do with those behaviors, that kidney function and so on. Following these lectures we will look at a very different aspect of the story very molecular, how do genes get affected by evolution on one hand, how do genes have something to do with the sort of brains we have. So beginning all the way on the left side of this chart, how have the events, how have the events of evolution, the natural selective pressures over millennia, over millions of years, sculpted the sort of brains and behaviors that we have? Now in introducing the subject of evolution, that's straightforward. We all know how evolution works. We all learned about it in ninth grade biology when we learned how come giraffes have long necks. And we all know the basic rules of evolution built around a couple of key points. The first one is certain traits are heritable. Certain traits are passed on from one generation to the next. For example, length of your neck. The second key point is there is variation that can occur in how those traits are passed on. Variation, we now understand in modern genetic molecular terms, there could be mutations in genes passed on from one generation to the next. And the third critical point is there is then selection. Some of those genetic variants are more fit, are more adaptive than others, and those individuals leave more copies of their genes. And as shown in this chart, this is the basic sort of logic of evolution. You've got multiple generations of one pedigree here and passing on whatever trait, whatever trait is heritable, whatever trait has a genetic component. And we see in pedigree B there's a mutation, a source of variability, and this happens to be a wildly maladaptive one. And as a result, by the second generation, B pedigree goes extinct. They don't reproduce, they don't survive, they don't pass on copies of their genes. Meanwhile, you can have a beneficial mutation, a beneficial source of variability. Selection does its thing then, and as a result, this pedigree, this version of this trait becomes more plentiful. That's the basic building blocks of evolution. We understand all of that, and all you do now in the next couple of lectures is substitute how the giraffe evolved the long neck and all its adaptive features to that, how we evolved certain behaviors.
That's all there is to it. The whole notion that the way our behaviors occur is as much sculpted by evolution, by the forces of natural selection, as how our heart has evolved to pump blood and how our necks are whatever shape and how our kidneys do whatever they do to retain water. Ah, the same rules for behavior except there is one hell of an inflammatory concept tucked away in there, the notion of genes of heritability having anything to do with behavior. And that is immensely controversial in certain quarters. And in other quarters, that's taken as a, well, of course, and it's perfectly obvious what we will be doing a lot in the coming lectures is wrestling with the issue of how do you tell if a certain behavior has a genetic component? How do you figure out, if ever, how much of a genetic component? And does that tell you anything about inevitability, genetic destiny? Very, very rarely. So we begin to think here about the evolution of behavior. And we all learned about how evolution applies to behavior. We all learned this thoroughly back when we were kids, or only if you're of the right generation. And we all got taught our evolutionary biology by Marlon Perkins. Okay, remember Marlon Perkins. Maybe you're not of the right age group. But Marlon Perkins was the host of this wildly successful show that I watched all throughout my childhood called Wild Kingdom. And they would cruise around and film animals in different interesting places. And he had this this poor toady of a guy named Jim who always had the job of having to wrestle the the giant boa constrictor and Marlon Perkins would sit off on the side there and tell us what was going on. And Marlon Perkins taught all of us about evolutionary biology. And here's the sort of scene where we all learn the subject. Okay, it's dawn on the savanna, and you're sitting there in East Africa, and there's some herd of a gazillion wildebeest. Wildebeest travel around in these huge herds of a million animals following the rains. The rains move across the plains of the Serengeti, and the wildebeest follow it around after that. What you wind up seeing is the wildebeest are always trying to find the grass that's greener on the next field, and they head over there and mow it down and move on, and you've got a problem here today, which is you've got this huge herd of a gazillion wildebeest, and there's this wonderful field over there just full of grass, and they can taste it already. And the one problem is right in front of them, there's a river, a river teeming with crocodiles who are just ready to shred one of these wildebeest as soon as it gets in the water. And they're all there and hemming and hawing in a panic, and what are they going to do? And suddenly, a Marlin Perkin-esque solution emerges from the back of the crowd of the wildebeest, this elderly wildebeest fights his way up to the front and he says, I sacrifice myself for you, mine kinder, and he throws himself into the river and he's instantly ripped apart by the crocs and while they're busy with him, everybody else tiptoes around the other way and why did he do that? Why did he get killed? And why did he fling himself involuntarily? And Marlon Perkins taught us the answer because animals behave for the good of the species. And this was the central concept that we all got hammered into our head, and this was wildly incorrect. This got discredited in the early 60s in scientific circles and stuck around with Marlon Perkins and sticks around to this day in the general notion, behavior has evolved for the good of the species. And it has not at all. This old notion of what is termed a group selection argument, behavior is driven by ways to increase the likelihood of the species surviving and multiplying, makes no sense at all. And all you have to do to appreciate it is if you watch those wildebeest a little bit longer than Marlin and his film crew did because something else was going on. So you look at all these wildebeest and they're all in a panic and how are you going to get across the river and they're all milling there and suddenly up comes this elderly wildebeest to the front. Why is he up there? He did not push his way to the front. He got pushed up there. They said, yeah, get the old guy up to the front. He's the only one who couldn't sort of withstand it. He gets pushed to the front and he gets pushed in the river. Volunteering, no way. He gets pushed in by everybody else and he gets done in at that point. There is no sacrificing himself for the good of the species. Evolution is not about evolving behaviors that optimize the survival of your species. And by the early 60s, what got ushered in instead was now what is the central concept of the field, what is termed individual selection. Animals behave not for the good of the species. Animals behave to optimize the number of copies of their own genes they pass on to the next generation. Evolution is not about survival of the fittest. Evolution is not about optimizing the survival of your species, the good of your species. What evolution is about is passing on as many copies of your own genes as possible 
into the next generation. And we will see some very important implications of this individual selection. Now, in lots of ways, probably the best way to think about it, or the one that's most caught the public's imagination, and one that is somewhat erroneous, is the notion of the selfish gene. The notion that your DNA, and we will see shortly what DNA is all about, but your DNA that makes up genes, what your genes are about is not helping the species to survive, but the purpose of your genes are to maximize your own ability to reproduce, the pass on copies of your genes. And a far better way of summarizing this was this wonderful quote by an ev early evolutionist late in the 19th century, a man named Samuel Butler, and he came up with this great aphorism. He said, sometimes a chicken is just an egg's way of making another egg. And that's like a wonderful way of viewing it. A chicken is just an egg's way of making all of this behavior stuff and all of this social interaction stuff is just this epiphenomenon to get some mating and to get a copy of the genes into the next generation. Sometimes an egg, in order to make another egg, produces this chicken with its behavior stuff. Sometimes behavior can be thought of as merely a way to optimize, to maximize the number of copies of genes that are passed on to a next generation. And this really has become the central concept in the field in lots of ways. This notion of individual selection, animals do not behave to enhance the survival of their own species, they behave to maximize the number of copies of their own genes. As we will see, this is not so straightforward and it is not so selfish on either the gene level or the individual level. It has a whole lot of interesting elaborations, but this is the building block of the whole system. And what this winds up producing is an explanation for an awful lot of animal behavior. There's a lot of versions of behaviors that don't make any sense until you frame it as individual selection rather than group selection. Let me give you one very grim example of this from the world of animal behavior as shown on this diagram, and this is one that makes no sense at all, is wildly pathologic if you were schooled in Marlon Perkins, and makes wonderful, horrible, tragic sense if instead you think in terms of contemporary evolutionary biology. Okay, you have a species, gorillas for example, or lions, or langur monkeys, a whole bunch of species that show this pattern. What you have is a stable social group made up of a whole bunch of females and their kids, and typically just one male in there. What is typically called a harem structure, but is just as readily called a, a gigolo structure. You've got a single male doing all the mating with the females. Where are all the other males? They are off in the periphery bachelor herds, is what it's called in some species. A bunch of these males off by themselves, or individual isolate males. And what do they want out of life? Of course, to take over this harem, to boot out the guy who's resident. And every now and then, one of them manages to do that, some big, aggressive interaction, and boots out the previous guy. Okay, what happens at that point? What happens was first discovered in the 1970s and people still imbued with sort of a group selection notion simply did not have any idea how to make sense of this. This new male comes in, becomes the resident male in this all-female group, and what does he proceed to do? He goes about systematically killing all of the infants he can in the group. This floored people. Number one, because there was a dominant notion at the time that, oh my God, you're not aggressive to infants. Infants have all sorts of features that inhibit aggression. And here you are having infanticide going on. This is totally bizarre until you begin to see a pattern. And this was one that was first identified by a primatologist named Sarah Hurdy, studying this first in Langer monkeys, a type of monkey in, found in India, seeing there's a pattern to it, a whole bunch of species now where you see this infanticide, and they all have the same populational structure. And it's shown here on this chart. Okay, suppose the female gives birth to an infant. What does she proceed to do as a good monkey mother? She nurses the kid, often for a year, for two years, a long nursing period. And as is a feature of nursing, thanks to stuff we learned in the endocrine lecture, you boost up levels of prolactin, prolactational, a hormone having to do with nursing, and prolactin inhibits ovulation. While the female is nursing for that period, she doesn't ovulate. 
Shortly after giving birth, the resident male, the male who fathered that infant, gets dumped by a new male who comes in and takes over. And the key point is, on the average, the length of time this new male is going to be in this group before he himself gets dumped, the average length of time is shorter than the amount of time that female is going to be nursing. What does this wind up meaning? What this means is this guy has spent the last six years going down to the gym and working out and he's finally all buffed up and tosses out this guy and he's going to be long gone and forgotten by the time this female is ovulating again. And what is the horrible, selfish evolutionary logic for this guy to do at this point, as shown on the bottom, come in and after he becomes a new resident male, kill the infant. The female stops nursing, ovulates a short time afterward, and he fathers the next kid. And this grim piece of evolutionary logic that makes no sense if you're Marlon Perkins makes perfect sense from the standpoint of this male trying to maximize the number of copies of his genes in the next generation. And there's a dozen species now that have this social structure as shown on top where you wind up seeing this infanticide. Now, naturally, the female is sitting there, and she's just as interested in evolutionary biology. She's not thrilled about losing her copy of genes into the next generation. And what you wind up seeing is females resist like crazy, trying to protect their kids. This all makes perfect sense from the individual selection level. And the greatest way of seeing just how much this is the case, how much animals do not behave for the good of the species, is that you see exactly this pattern of competitive infanticide in one of the most endangered species on this planet, a species that's probably going to be extinct within our lifetime, the gorilla. The gorilla has this social structure and they are close to extinction for a bunch of reasons. Habitat degradation, warfare around their hunting of them, killing of them for trophies, all sorts of tragic things. And on top of that, every now and then, a male gorilla kills the infants there. Animals do not behave for the good of the species. So we have this first building block of modern evolutionary biology. Sometime a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. Now we shift to the second building block. And it has to do with a very important notion, which is you are related to your relatives. What does that mean in biological terms? You share genes with that with that individual, and the whole notion of the second level, kin selection, inclusive fitness, is the simple idea that sometimes the best way to pass on copies of your genes, as many as possible to the next generation, is to reproduce as much as you can, but sometimes the best way is to help your relatives reproduce as much as they can. And this notion of kin selection begins to describe a central feature of every social species out there, including us, which is an obsession with kinship. Who do you cooperate with? Who do you fight with? Who's them? Who's us? Built around lines of relatedness. Now, the important thing to appreciate here, and shown in this diagram that is so complex you have to pay no attention to it, is some relatives you're more related to than others. A full sibling you're more related to than a half sibling, a parent more than a grandparent. And that could be stated mathematically what percentage of your genes you share in common. And ignoring the details of the number, the simple fact is the more steps away a relative is, the fewer genes you share in common. And the logic, and for most part the data support this logic, what you wind up seeing in this kin selection notion is you will be more cooperative with relatives as a function of how related they are to you, the more genes you have in common. And what kin selection inclusive fitness is about is sometimes the best way to pass on a copy of your genes is to reproduce once. Sometimes if you have a full sibling who shares half of your genes with you, if you help that sibling in a way that allows them to reproduce twice, to hand on two copies, sets of copies of their genes, mathematically one set of yours or two copies of someone sharing half of your genes with you, it's identical from a genetic standpoint. Point. And either of those behaviors have the exact same impact on evolution. And this was wonderfully summarized in a quote by this geneticist, Haldane, early in the last century, who apparently was sitting in a bar once and trying to describe this concept to the other guys there, and did some calculations and said, I would gladly lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. And mathematically, that's exactly how it works.
And what this begins to explain is this wild obsession with relatedness, with kinship, with relatives throughout the animal world. You get some social anthropologists and they spend their entire careers trying to understand the kinship terms of this one tribe in the upper Volta River of West Africa. This is nothing compared to animal obsession with patterns of relatedness because it completely determines who you cooperate with and who you don't. A couple of examples. There's lots and lots of species out there, and there's lots of human cultures that have polygamy, where one male will mate with multiple females, where one male will pass on copies of his genes with multiple females, far rarer in the animal world and in the human world of human cultures is polyandry, a single female with more than one male. Among animals, it's found occasionally in lions, it's found in marmoset monkeys in the New World, there's a bunch of bird species. Among humans, there's a number of cultures in Asia, particularly in Tibet and Nepal, where you see this pattern and in every single one of these cases, it's a very special type of polyandry. It's something called Adelphic polyandry. Who are the two males? who were the resident males in this lion pride, who were the two males who were the husbands of this woman in Nepal, their brothers. Their brothers, that's the pattern you always see. This Adelphic polyandry makes perfect sense. Why should these two perfect stranger males cooperate in a marriage? They're not perfect stranger males. They're sharing 50% of their genes. This is exactly the sort of thing that's predicted by kin selection. Some more examples of how to think about kin selection, and this one is so obvious it doesn't even count as an interesting observation until you think about it. You got some food, you're some baboon, you're some whatever, and you share it with someone. Who do you share it with? And food sharing in all sorts of species goes along lines of relatedness. Well, yes, obviously mothers feed their kids in all sorts of species, but even things like you've got to kill, and who do you allow to feed off of it as well? And in lots of studies you see the degree of relatedness is a wonderful predictor of how much you share food with another individual. More examples of this, and this is one that you wind up seeing which will seem terribly familiar to anyone who's a parent, and this goes by the official jargon in the evolutionary biology world of parent-offspring conflict. Basically built around the following math, which seems bizarre to apply almost economic terms to thinking about stuff, but you are this mother, you are this primate mother, you are this bird mother, you are this any mother, and you've got this offspring. You are doing your evolutionary calculations, and this brings up an important point. No animal is sitting there consciously aware of any of these principles. These have evolved, been sculpted by evolution. When I say what this bird wants to do, what this brine shrimp maximizes at that point, there's no conscious volition there. This has simply been sculpted by evolution. So you're that parent sitting there, and what you want is, of course, your offspring to survive. Are you willing to give up every bit of your future reproductive potential to help this offspring survive as well as possible? Absolutely not. You are balancing the survival of this offspring with that of future individuals. In contrast, what does the kid want? They want all of the investment, and that's actually the economic term that's used by these folks. They want all of the investment possible. What you wind up getting is conflict between the kid wanting more care from the parent than the parent offers. Where is the scene in animals when mothers try to wean their kids? And you get parent-offspring conflict. You look at some baboons and there will be a mother walking along and there's the year-old kid who she's trying to wean who is literally throwing a tantrum and she's pushing the kid off, stop nursing, stop nursing, because once I stop nursing I'm going to ovulate. Again, not a conscious strategy. This is what you wind up seeing. However, suppose it's an older female who's not likely to have more kids, you don't see the weaning battles then. And you see the selection between generations in a sense in a battle for energetic investment. This makes no sense until you think about it in evolutionary terms. Okay, so that gives us the second building block. First one, forget Marlon Perkins and group selection. Individual selection, sometimes a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. Second level, kin selection. Sometimes the best way to pass on copies of your genes are to help relatives do so. I'll lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. The third final building block is what's termed reciprocal altruism. Even amongst non-relatives, sometimes it makes sense to cooperate. And we've got all these great 
you know, proverbs for many hands, make the task light, or who knows what amongst hunters, for example. If you all share the kill, that distributes the risk each time when it's something that has a low success rate. Reciprocity is a very, very common thing in all sorts of social species, even among non-relatives. And what you then have are all sorts of rules for when does reciprocity evolve. And this is a subject we will return to in some subsequent lectures in tremendous detail because this turns out to be a whole field that mathematicians work on. All sorts of mathematics of games, and this is a formal term in economics and math, of game theory, when do you cooperate, when do you fail to, very complex mathematical models. So when do you wind up seeing this, and we will look at this again in far more detail, but as a first pass, what sort of species do you see reciprocal altruism, patterns of cooperation among non-relatives? Well, it makes sense. First off, you got to have a social species. You're not going to see it in orangutans, for example, where these are very solitary animals, nomadic in many cases. You've got to have a social species. Next thing you have to have is not only social groups, but stable social groups. It makes no sense at all for to lend you the money to buy a hamburger today and you'll pay me back next Tuesday if, if our social group is fluid enough that I'm going to be long gone in the next valley by then. What else do you need? You need to have species that are long lived enough that you're actually going to be alive next Tuesday. Then you need to have a certain amount of social intelligence so you could recognize who the individual is. So you remember who it is. You have to see this in more socially complex, more cognitively complex species. And remember that finding we had in an earlier lecture across 150 different primate species, the bigger the social group, the bigger the relative size of your cortex. And the argument has been that has evolution sculpting our brains to keep track of social economic, social commerce, social interactions, and reciprocity being a big piece of it. The final thing that you see, and this is the basis of all the mathematics, all the game theory, the final thing that goes on in these games of reciprocal altruism is you want to cheat whenever you can, and you want to be incredibly vigilant against other individuals who might cheat against you. And we will see all sorts of mechanisms, ways in which this has evolved in animal species. What we see here, though, are just a very few quick examples of how this reciprocity works. One example is with vampire bats, which, despite their horrible reputation, are actually warm, affectionate mothers who go out each night to get blood from cows, typically, fill up a throat sack full of blood, and come back to their nest where they disgorge the blood, disgorge it to feed babies, disgorge it to feed babies, not just their babies. All the females feed each other's babies, even among non-relatives. This is a system of reciprocity. How can you prove it? You engineer experimentally a way in which one of the females fails to do that, and her kids are not fed the next time. Reciprocal altruism in this sense. Other versions of this, you find amongst baboon males, males will occasionally form coalitions, partnerships, backing them up in fights, and you look across years in a social group, and the coalitions are not random. Who forms the coalitions with each other? Partners who have reciprocated in previous settings. It's a structure like that as well. Another example, this is a great one that you see with stickleback fish. Of all things, a species that you can study this complex mathematics of behavior and cooperation in, turns out sticklebacks have been evolved to do this as well. Okay, you make a stickleback fish believe it is being threatened by another stickleback fish. These are not some of the smarter animals around, so it's done quite easily. You stick a mirror up on the side of the fish tank, and before you know it, the fish is bashing its lips against the glass there to keep this other guy away and doing this whole defensive thing. Now make it think that it has a partner. Take a second mirror and put it perpendicular to this fish so it's glancing over there. It sees its reflection. It sees its reflection of its reflection. It's sitting there saying, okay, I don't know who this guy is, but he's really backing me up here because there's a second fish attacking. And every time I attack this guy, he's there. I can really trust this guy. Great, I got a partner here. And now make the fish believe he's being cheated against. Take the mirror and angle it a little bit so that the reflection is set back a few inches. And he's sitting there saying, that son of a bitch, I can't believe that guy. Here I am blistering my lips, protecting our territory. And sure, he's pretending to go forward, but I see him hanging back a few inches there. He believes he's being cheated against, and the next time he fails to attack his image. 
he is reciprocating against the cheating there, cheat against me and the next time I will cheat back. And we will see complex mathematical models which have often been exactly the ones that animals have evolved. So with this first pass at thinking about the evolution of biology, we have moved past the notion that animals behave for the good of the species to survival of the fittest, instead individual selection, maximizing the number of copies of your genes. Kin selection, sometimes the best way to do that is to help relatives pass on copies of theirs. Reciprocal altruism, sometimes one of the best ways to do it is to set up systems of cooperation even with non-relatives but with very strict rules of vigilance against cheating. This whole structure, and this is essentially the structure of modern evolutionary biology thinking about behavior, is highly explanatory. What we will now do in subsequent lectures is look at more detailed examples of this, beginning to frame it, how does all of this, sculpted by evolution to maximize this or that passing on of genes, how does this translate into the sort of brains we have evolved?